All right. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Tom Featherston. I'm going to give a talk on how to read code. And it's kind of more general than that because you know, you, you know, as programmers, enthusiasts, there's an awful lot of stuff out there. we get, got to learn an awful lot of stuff. So this is kind of like reading code, reading. And uh, you know, I'm an enthusiast for Python. I've got a CS degree I got a few years ago while I was playing around in between jobs. And it's the quickest way to get out of college with all those accumulated credits. But no one's been foolish enough to actually hire me to uh, code yet. But we'll see. Okay, so... This is about reading code. And the odd, the, kind of the genesis of this talk was, you know, I'm in the library and they're, you know, getting rid of books and whatnot. And I come across a book on content reading, content area reading, which is, you know, an uh, education uh, book for teachers, how to teach people how to read. And I thought, oh, I wonder if there's any cross between this and actually reading code. And as it turns out, there are a lot of things that this points out that are applicable. So that was kind of the genesis of this talk. So let's start out. Okay, so originally this was going to be a talk where I was going to do like a code walkthrough and like just show you, okay, this is a good tool to do this, this is a good tool to do that. Turn out there's an awful lot of stuff here. I mean, I, I do have a little project I can talk about. It might have made it into the notes, but uh, we may or may not get to that. I just found there were too many techniques. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this in 40 minutes, you know, give you a very detailed view because there's just so many tools you can have in your tool set. So, it's, it's, if I can use an analogy, I, you know, I've installed medical equipment, uh, you know, and worked on medical suites and that sort of thing. And there are when you go to an installation, you know, you've got your tools there. You've got other people with their tools. You're working on something. You put the tool down. Somebody else takes it. Uh, you, you don't remember where you put it. You don't get your tools back at the end. So, you know, this is just the way it went. And then I ended up working with this guy who had his own system for tools. What he would do, you know, he wouldn't worry about my tools, your tools. He would... Keep his tools. He brought in three bags, and he had these bags labeled, well, at least conceptually, twisters. So this were tools like screwdrivers. You turn something. Uh, he had cutters for saws, scissors, that sort of thing. And he had a bag for smashers, hammers, and that sort of thing. <laughs> and so he would put these three bags out, and, you know, whenever you used the tool, you would put it back in that general tool bag. So what I'm going to do here, basically, is bring my bags of tools, pick out a few, and then it'll be up to you to, like, take some of these tools home and, you know, put them back onto the old uh, pegboards and whatnot in your own, you know, mental workshop as you read code and whatnot. So here we go. Like I said, it's a collection of hints at this point. Okay, there'll be two worlds that we'll be getting our techniques from. There's a world that I mentioned that this book covered, which was, you know, teaching content area reading. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, what they mean by that is, you know, there's a way to read, you know, just general literature. There's a way to read in, you know, history subjects. There's a way to read into physics and science and biology. And uh, what they wanted to do was to teach people how to do that, how to adapt to the area of content they're reading, and how to develop techniques of reading for their students. So I'm going to throw out some things from that. Then there's the world, more specifically, of Python, and more generally just computer programming. And there are some things that specifically applied to that area and come from that world. So we'll go over things like that. Okay. So first thing, just going to talk about some things that apply to both worlds. You know, we have a problem with code, and uh, if you were in the talk earlier, we're, uh, one of the earlier talks, he was talking like reporting like a half a million lines of code and that sort of thing. So it's kind of like how do we deal with things that are that massive? 
I mean, just just the um, the included batteries, included libraries, and whatnot. You know, a lot of people don't use that because they, you know, haven't delved into it and they don't know all the functions that are there. Because there's a massive amount of code just there. So how do we deal with things like that in general? Yeah, well, there's a technique, you know, something called chunking, which means uh, instead of dealing with, you know, all the lines individually, you've got to come up with ways to, you know, like say, well, these 10 lines... You know, they they form a higher unit that I, you know, have conceptually in my head. And so I don't have to, like, remember those lines individually, word for word, because that's not the way the human mind works. You know, you just have to, when you get familiar with code, depending on what level you're going for, you've got to, like, deal with things at a higher level. And one of the big memory techniques is chunking, because, you know, there's that old rule, you can only hold, like, seven things in memory at one time as you're as you're going to memorize it, seven plus or minus two. And so the way you deal with things that are more massive than seven is like create units, subunits, and then you just hold the units in. So you're still just working with a few number of things at a time. Uh, so that's chunky. Now, another thing you've got to look at when you're dealing with learning or reading the code or is, you know, what's your purpose? You know, there's purpose for like general reading, you know, for, uh, and, you know, what could you, what are your purposes there be? Well, if it's a, you know, a science fiction paperback, you know, you don't have to do much more than read it because you're reading it for entertainment. But if you're reading it for learning, you know, there's some things you can do to, you know, facilitate the transfer up into your head if it's something that you're, you know, going to need further on down the line. Like when you got somebody on the operating table or whatnot. What was that thing from uh, not a good time? Not a good time. So we got similar purposes that we've, you know, you might have going into doing some reading of code. You might be going into, you know, as you're starting out to let's like, well, what's good style in this language? You know, so you might be reading for that. Uh, you might want to learn the different ways uh, to structure an application. So you might be going in to read for, okay, what's the structure of an application and how's that laid out? you know, specifically in Python in this case. You might want to create a, a similar program. Uh, you might want to add a feature, you know, just dive in real quick, you know, shuffle around. Oh, here's where I can put this, and here's something that's similar. I'll just pull that code out, look at it, structure my code like that. So that might be a purpose. Or you might want to, you know, contribute to a project. It's like something that really excites you or something you're interested in, and you might, you know, you, you want to get that project at a, you know, a deep enough level where you could become one of, the, like, the main developers for that. So that's another level of purpose you might be reading for. So we've got those two things that kind of apply to both. I mean, you know, in just reading to learn, you have a purpose. Reading code, you'd have a purpose. Okay, this is going to show up there. All right, uh, techniques from the world of teaching. This one side's way too long, apparently. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, I man who wrote Faust. Those who make the assumption that literacy carries with it the ability to read do not know what time and trouble it costs to learn to read. I've been working at it for 80 years, and I can't say yet that I am completely successful. So it's kind of the approach you want to take of this. There's always more to learn that you, I mean, we want to get some facility with this. So it, it may be time to like go beyond our assumptions that we already know how to do it. All right. Okay, these are some techniques I go over from the world of teaching reading or content area reading. You know, talking to learn, writing to learn, vocabulary and concepts, prior knowledge and interests, study strategies, study guides. And I'll try to reinterpret them in the world of reading Python code. Okay, talking to learn. Now, this is kind of like the hardest to adapt because usually when you're reading code, there's only you. So... There are ways that we can adapt this that I'll talk about, but you, know, you might want to look at, can you get someone else involved with 
going over this code. I mean, you know, if you're, you're just starting out and you want to learn things, you know, it might be a good idea to, you know, get with somebody and, like, go over one of the modules in the standard library, you know, and just go at it together in pairs. Or you might want to do it online. Or if, you know, if you're still doing it by yourself, you know, you have the option at times to, like, just go out and ask a question on one of the Q&A sites, uh, you know, and something that might guide you and get you over some humps that you might incur. Or, you know, you can start, chat, you know, start your own hashtag on Twitter, you know, I'm, and, you know, see if anybody latches onto that or get an IRC channel. So there are ways to, like, talk that, you know, get you out of just having yourself. But if you got yourself, I mean, this is the uh, age of technology and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there are plenty of apps for, like, recording your voice, you know, so you, you can make, like, a lightweight trail uh, of things. You know, there are, there are apps where you can, like, uh, have a mind map that takes uh, uh, picture notes and uh, take, let you enter text and also let you record your voice and whatnot. So it's a, there are things available today through technology that uh, can make it so you can talk and capture that. That's one of the things I find, you know, I'm studying something, you know, I'm having great insights. I really got this little piece of code and I, you know, had a thought of like, oh, I could do something over here with that. You know, and five minutes later, if I haven't captured it, you know, it's gone. We got technology today. Uh, now there's some techniques that they go over. Uh, something to like guide you when you're talking uh, and you'll see these repeated in some of the other approaches I like there's what they call no want learn or KLM you know it, you want to like say well what do I know about this already before you start what do I want to know you know and then after, you know after you've wrestled with the material a while what did I learn it's a way to structure uh, your approach. Another thing is what they call directed reading. Now, this is where, you know, you, 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 and, you know, it's, it's harder to do when it's yourself again, but the idea is uh, you want to, like, see what you're going after inside of the code and, you know, what act, you know, what thinking activities, you know, reading something could, could, uh, you know, call forth for you. All right, so now another level is writing to learn. So in writing to learn, and it's really a, it's a valid way to, you know, learn something is, you know, write about it. So uh, break this down to like three types of writing to learn. There's exploratory writing. That's where, you know, you're, you're, you're just starting out. You're just starting to wrestle with it. Uh, you make some observations, you know, it, so it's kind of messy, tentative, unfinished. It's just. Just like when you're first noodling around with things. Now, another level, you know, it was just essays in the book. But, you know, we have the option today of, like, creating blogs. There are a lot of people who, like, go into something and they, like, see where they get with it. And they want to, like, share that out there in the world. So they put it in their blog. And whether you do that or not, you can come from that. It's like, okay, if I was writing a blog... You know, what would I say about this bit of code that I read here? You know, how would I guide someone through it? Uh, there's something they call uh, discourse forms, you know, a lot of which aren't applicable. But basically what a discourse form is, you're just playing with one form of writing and you're like varying your viewpoint of like what it would be to come at this from being this person, like, like for... History, it's like, you know, you imagine yourself as a pioneer and writing in your little diary and, you know, writing Little House on the Plarium and whatnot. I mean, you have the option of, like, doing things like that where, I mean, you can take the viewpoint, okay, what would a newbie, you know, how would he come at this? And, you know, that could be a discourse form. You could, uh, <clears throat> well, if, you, if you've got enough 
good enough model. You could uh, pretend to be some other programmer that you know who's like really opinionated uh, and has this distinct way of looking at things. You know, you just pretend to be Gary Burkhardt, if, you know, if you know him and just like, OK, what would Gary say with something like this? Just another way to look at things. And, you know, uh, and just coming out as a blog, blog's kind of a discourse form in itself because that's just a form of presenting information. And like I said, I mean, they talk about like unsent letters. They can be unsent blogs. It doesn't really mean that you're going to like publish this as a blog, but it's just a way to structure your approach to this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Another thing, you know, that's had a lot of value down through the ages is journal writing. I mean, you know, there are you know, scientists keep journals. Uh, you, I mean, diaries are a firm of journals. There are lots of journals, and they've had a lot of value in the past, and they can bring some value to code reading. And, um, well, you know, as, as geekier people, I mean, a Python conference, come on. <laughs> you know, we tend to approach things pretty intellectually, and whatnot, and you know, but the truth is, you know, we're we're complete human beings. I mean, and the idea of like a uh, response journal is you're not capturing just the information that you're getting, but you're you're ca trying to capture a bit of, you know, well, how do I feel about this? What are the emotions that I get? You know, what's going on in the whole experience of like learning this? What's that eliciting that in me? And and trying to capture that. I have this um, theory about like recall when you're trying to recall things, you know, if you've, if you've gone and pared things down to like the bare minimum and you're trying to work just from the bare minimum, you're actually cutting out a lot of the clues that will let you recall things and work with code. So, you know, you might want to look at, okay, well, how are things, you know, how is this talking to me? You know, double entry is another form of that. You're kind of like saying, <clears throat> well, I had this reaction to this and this, you know, the left-hand column, and then what you learned, you know, over in the right-hand column. And, you know, it might be something like, oh, this is a really cool way to do this, you know. Or I saw something similar, you know, in the past over here. This kind of reminds me of that. Little notes like that. <clears throat> and then there's just a learning log. You want to, like, keep track, short little notes of, like, oh, I, you know, I learned this, you know, time and date stamp it. You know, I learned this. Just little, little um, reminders of what you actually covered. Okay. Another thing when you're, when you're reading, you know, you've got to have vocabulary and you've got to have the concepts. And that's why we're reading the code. And you shouldn't, like, consider this separate. It's like you don't want to be like, okay, I'll read this and then I'll, like, Oh, well, they just introduced generators or something here. I don't really know those yet, you know. Okay, I'll go and look that up. Like that's a separate activity. It, it's really part of the whole reading of it. I mean, yes, you're still going off and looking about generators, but you're also, like, putting it back into the code that you're reading so you're, you, you like, get the sense of what you just read med, meant so you can, like, build up the concepts, get Increase your knowledge on areas that you're, you know, you may have not seen before or you're weak on. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I better hit this. Okay. If I can get it open. <laughs> Why don't I get my assistant? <laughs> That's what he's for. The water opener. Water boy. So, I mean, direct, direct experience is the best teacher. But we have a thing here. It's code. I mean, where's our direct experience with that? I mean, you know, maybe in pair programming where you're sitting down with someone, you're getting to watch how they're doing things, and you're getting to see how you do things. Thanks. But mostly it's canned. It's canned in the code. So, I mean, we got to do the next best thing. I mean, we've got to, you know... Uh, kind of have ways to like mock it up that it's direct you know you can like pretend you you know i just wrote this and you could go you know look at it from that way well like, okay 
just trying to make it more personal. There's more personal involvement with what you're reading rather than just, you know, this is body of code. I got to get through X number of pages, you know, and once I'm done, I'll have it in my head. No, I mean, um, I mean, in looking at memory these days, they, they've discovered that, you know, you're, when, you, when you go hit a memory in the past, it's not like you're going back to the past and pulling out some tape that's got the whole incident recorded on it and putting it in and playing it. It's really reconstruction. I mean, you're, you're going into what you call the past and, you know, you, you know some parts of the incident and you, you really kind of like make up the circumstances that would like match that. And people have a lot of trouble with this because, you know, they really think that, oh, yeah, I really got the true memory. But that is not the way memory works. And in code, it's like, like I said, it would be ridiculous to try and, like, know a body of code line by line, word for word. You've got to, like, suss out the patterns in the code and, you know, use those and your experience with code to, like, kind of recall generally what it's doing. So the, you, it's more like a, you know, in truth, it's more like a feeling that you that you know what the code's doing you know and you know how to get around in it that you're going for rather than like knowing the code dead on line after line okay so vocabulary uh, comes in three parts i mean there's just just everyday words you don't have to worry about that there are special words I'm, with a special vocabulary, that's like everyday words, but they're being used a little bit differently. And then there's technical vocabulary. And, you know, that would be something specific, like generators. I mean, that's, you know, that's not a concept that you see in that many other languages, or at least not by that name. So those are forms of vocabularies. Now, Concepts are the things that we're trying to capture with words. I mean, when you have like a concept and its definition, there could be a thousand words like describing that concept. And the idea here is, again, it's that chunking concept. You know, you want that word that's, you know, naming that concept to like stand for all those words that, you know, explain that concept so you can like hold it in your head with the smaller word in its place. And the thing about concepts is you learn them, you've got to like look at the relationships in between them. So, you know, there are always concepts that are, you know, at a much higher level that may have subparts. And, you know, as you're learning things, you want to be cognizant of that uh, relationship with the things that you're learning. So to do that, I mean, some tools to like, keep that in your forefront, you might like take your concepts, group them into hierarchies, you know, graph them out with little sticks, you know. Uh, you might want to, like, look at the concepts and, like, see, you know, how, you know, on a scale, one to five, do I know this? You know, what's my understanding of this at this time? Um, another activity you can do, you can, like, take the concepts and, like, sort them out into different categories and then, you know, give them labels, Okay, prior knowledge and interest. This is kind of the glue between learning. I mean, you're always building on something you already know, and it's, it's the only way to learn. Uh, and to be more successful at that, you want to build up your interest, your expectations, so what you, so what you, uh, so you can read with and uh, with purpose and anticipation. You. you yeah, yeah, programmers were, you know, we got this bad habit of like, okay, I just want to code, you know, and so we jump into it. And, you know, our teachers have been railing at us for years. No, that's not really the way to do it in real life. You know, you'll learn that eventually. You got to have some thought beforehand. When you're reading code, you got to put some thought into it uh, to begin with anyway. So... <clears throat> So a way to do this is to, like, build up your interest, build up your expectations, define, you know, say what your purpose in reading this is. And, like, you know, it's like you can be, 
excited to like learn this. It's like, oh, you know, I've been meaning to learn about generators. There are quite a few in this example here. This is a good time for me to like figure that out. So you want to you want to rouse your curiosity about what the code's doing. You want to make predictions about how it's doing that. Because you already got some, enough knowledge to like, okay, well, there'll probably be these methods in there. They might use state machines or something. You know, different approaches that, you know, I'll probably see. And you, you want to like make those predictions ahead of time so you can like read and then see if it's in there. And you want to ask questions ahead of time. You know, see, you know, I, you know, I'm reading to get answers to this. Okay. You know, some some strategies to study. You, know, you make pictures. Now, Python doesn't have a lot of pictures in it. I mean, there are other languages that, you know, there's, I mean, there is U, UML, you know, a lot of that stuff in Java and whatnot. We don't use that sort of stuff in Python because we're kind of like we're blessed with a language that doesn't require it. But there's nothing wrong with making pictures to understand what's really going on. You can write summaries. You know, this this block does this. You know, the, the, there's a style now to like not put a lot of comments in code, but like if you're reading it, you're kind of making up your own comments. Uh, you want to follow the code structure. I mean, really, the code structure is, at, you know, at a high level. I mean, that's a high enough level that you can, like, get some feel for that. This is, you know, we're going to have to use sequence. We're going to have to do some conditionals here. We're going to have to loop over something here. And those are higher level concepts that can stand in for a lot of codes and do a little chunking for you. And want to make notes as you go along. And you might want to use study systems. Now, this was my only uh, study systems is something, you know, I can remember in English class, they tried to like teach us this SQ3R and whatnot. And, you know, it was, it was a good study strategy, but after a while, you didn't really like follow it because it's like too many steps and you just wanted to get the paper done and get out of class. But now that we're doing this from ourselves, we can bring these back in, and once again, with technology, it's not as heavy as it used to be. We can capture things in a way that's a lot lighter weight. I'll speak to that when I get to, like, technologies we can use. Study guides. Now, study guides are there to, like, help you get through code, to, like, inform you in your reading of the code. Now, there are, you know, you won't necessarily, or you, you won't find, you know, a study guide to every piece of code you want to study. But there are study guides out there. Uh, and, you know, if you're reading Python to learn Python or to learn to be more Pythonic, uh, you know, there's a um, module of the, of the week. It's the blog and it actually turned into a book where somebody uh, goes over the standard modules, you know, and uh, talks about them. And you can, like, use that as a study guide when you go in and, you know, study that same module. Um, you know, books will often talk about, you know, a particular, you know, a code in a way that's much like a study guide. So that's available to you. And if there isn't any, I mean, you can make your own. Again, with the, uh, you know, you could be using the idea, well, like, okay, what if I was writing a blog and, you know, I was doing my own module of the week. Um, so there are various types of study guides that you can use. Um, I mean, you can put up a guide that's a guide to patterns. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about patterns on a bunch of levels in a bit. But uh, I'm, you probably run into the concept of patterns, and even if you hadn't, it, it's not that difficult an idea. It's like there are problems that there are common approaches to. Why reinvent the wheel? You know, follow this pattern the way other people follow them, and you know, codify it, give it a name, and then you've got that in your toolkit. So you could be reading the code and looking for patterns. This is often a good thing to do because, again, that's one of those chunking concepts. It's like if I know that you know this half a page is from this pattern, it's defining classes to do this sort of thing. It's a factory pattern or it's a delegator pattern. You know, just knowing that I've like summarized all that in a form like. 
if like I lost it, you know, the hard drive crash, you know, I could like use that to recreate it. And that's kind of what we're going for. That's the understanding of level of code that we're going for. Uh, there's a concept guide. I mean, what concepts are being introduced here? Uh, there's something that is called selective reading guide. That would be, uh, that's a little bit more lightweight, and that's more in like if you were like guiding someone else. And you can pretend that, you know, okay, I'm going to be teaching this at class tomorrow. You, you can take that as a way to you know, inform your interacting with it. And, a, you know, a selective reading guide is just like, okay, in, you know, in the block of code from line yada da to yada da, you know, you know, find the variables. Uh, why did they name, you know, this call that way? You know, things that would, like, guide the thinking of someone who came after you into, like, being able to make their way through the code. Okay, so let's go on to just programming and leave the world of uh, content area. So, as I was saying, you know, patterns are, uh, you know, they're really just another word for chunking in a way because and thank you and they're um they're really a very powerful way to to deal with your code because you've got to compress it in order to be able to hold it in your head you know and deal with it at some level um there's there's a whole body of work called design patterns now um uh, Brendan Rhodes did a talk on design patterns in Path Python last year. You know, I'm going to have that in my uh, notes uh, on that, but it's up on YouTube. And what he found when he was looking at, you know, just the basic, the, there's one standard book uh, called, uh, gang, you know, By the Gang of Four, they called them, you know, which kind of introduced uh, the idea of design patterns in the first place. And what Brandon found is that Python actually has a, a number of the patterns in it built in, you know, that they don't really have to be in our tool kit because Guido and the people who made Python for us, like, put those patterns into the language and they're just there available to us. But there are some that, you know, actually can, you know, and do need to be coded up when you use them. And so it's, it's good to be able to deal with design patterns at that level. Uh, but I, I just recently came across a, a book, uh, it's on creativity, called Inside the Box Thinking. And Inside the Box Thinking uh, is like going against some of the ideas that you may have already had about creativity. I mean, you know, uh, you know brainstorming and coming up with ideas and not, you know, criticizing until it's the time to weed out, you know, these people found that, you know, that's really not where you get the most creative ideas. Where you get the most creative ideas is when you take the world as closed and you only use what you have around you available already. And the reason why I bring this up into relation to, to patterns is they actually have like just four patterns that they use to foster creativity. And it, uh, it actually goes back to uh, work of this Russian engineer back in World War II. You may have heard of it. There's some, I think it's called Triz um, methodology, where he found in like analyzing patents that when patent inventions came up, they followed you know, basic formats. You know, you, you know, and there were basic patterns to creativity. And he, you know, he had, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 of these patterns and whatnot. And these people have taken that work and, like, reduced them down to four. And so, again, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this. It's actually, it looks like it's going to have a lot of uh, applicability to the world of programming. But, again, it's like, okay, when we can get all the different design patterns in there, well, hundreds or thousands of them at this point, and you know, just be able to categorize them into four different types of patterns. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, and they're simple. You know, it's like, okay, look at subtracting something out of what you had. And I mean, it's very applicable to code when you're thinking about it. It's like, okay, these are the parts of my code. 
what if I took out that object? You know, how could, how would that change my code? How, how would I have to adapt my code to, you know, have it work again? I, I, and does it, does it make any new possibilities available to me, you know, having that module? I mean, maybe I'm just like stuck and fixated on, oh yeah, this is just the way it has to be. You know, just the, just the idea of like taking out that little code can like really foster your creativity. And it can also be used to, in this case, to understand things because you can, you know, I mean, unless you're, you're dealing with pure genius, there's always improvements that can be made to code. And you want to see that because you want to be able to do that for yourself. So, like I said, very interesting book. I think it's going to have applicability to software writing at a high level. So that's one way to, you know, categorize patterns. And there's, you know, different classifications you can have of patterns. Uh, well, I don't want to install... <laughs> And updates. Thank you very much, Windows. Ah. Uh, there's use case patterns. These have to do with how you uh, how you're going to how your user is going to use your software, dealing with the interface issues, um, which is the next one. Uh, there's logic uh, patterns that encode business logic. So. Um, these are, you know, different patterns. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are books, there's, there's uh, resources on the web. A lot of this stuff, unfortunately, uh, seems to come from Java. I mean, they seem to deal with that the most. So if you do get one of these books, you've got to get, do some translating. But there's some gems there. So it's worth some study. Okay, so another way to chunk code is, you know, and it's just something to be cognizant of. There's what's called Pythonic, you know, or Pyth Python idioms that are like ways that we use the language um, that are different than from other languages. But, you know, if you like try to use the way you, you know how to do things from other languages, you won't be doing it Pythonically. And so, you know, if you've got these, you know, idioms in your head or if you're on the lookout for them and you're like always adding them to your tool book, you know, and you can do a bunch of that by studying the standard library because a lot of that code is Pythonic. I mean, then you can, you know, you're again chunking. It's like always using, you know, uh, un, you know, tuple unpacking to set variables here or to avoid, you know, avoid having to swap variable. You know, there are these patterns that we have uh, that are just like part of the language and part of the convention too. I mean, they're not necessarily built into the language. It's just the ways that people who do Python do it because they feel it's the most beautiful way and the most succinct way to do it. Okay, these didn't get filled out so much. All right, so naming guidelines. Looking at namings is a big part of um, being able to deal with code. And there are a lot of different, you know, patterns in naming. Uh, I mean, and uh, yeah, Brandon had, you know, talked about this in one of his talks. Should be in the notes. Uh, there are a number of, you know, there are videos on the, the resources for this. There, there are blogs on the web talking about naming conventions. You know, uh, if you got a function, yeah, you more than likely you want a verb in that function's name. Uh, variable, you know, it's it's going to be some noun for it. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, we're, we're dealing with combo names and whatnot. Uh, you know, another pattern is like name and then verb, you know. So there are these naming conventions, and, and you need to be, like, on the lookout for them. And, you know, a good way to interact with your code is, like, is this the way I would have named this? Or is there a more, you know, a way that communicates more? Um, and on Brandon's talk, he was talking about, you know, refactoring this code and, you know, often that just meant looking through it, changing different, choosing different variable names that communicated more accurately what he was doing than the words that he, you know, you know, the names he used in the beginning. And just by doing that, it made the code more understandable. It was true to what was actually being done. And, you know, he said, you know, if there's one thing that he could do if he could go back to, you know, and talk to himself, you know, 
10 years ago, he'd say, when you, when you, when you got your code written and it's working, you're halfway done. So they're just refactoring for understanding. And, and you can use this as a, you know, an exercise, something to motivate you as you're reading. Partitioning of functionality. I mean, we don't, I mean, uh, we do that in several ways in, in Python. Uh, we've got modules uh, which, you know, form their own namespaces. And that's a good way to, like, um, Parsing out the functionality of what the program's doing. So you, when you're reading, you want to see, well, how did they set this up? Uh, there's classes, which, you know, is more, it's actually used more in other languages than uh, Python. Python actually, with the ideas of modules and namespaces and whatnot, can do a lot of things without classes. So we don't really necessarily have to go to classes. But classes are another way of, like, uh, you know, classes have their own built-in namespaces and whatnot, and sometimes it's more natural to deal with things in terms of classes because you're modeling something that's occurring in the real world, and there are analogs to help guide your thinking. But it, you know, it, you know, when I was you know, working on my degree, it's like objects were the thing that were going to save programming and make it, you know, the new way to do things. And found out not so much. All right, so let's see where I am. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, when you're dealing with classes and functions, you know, you've got attributes and methods, but a, a higher level to think of that is, okay, what responsibilities am I dividing up between these uh, classes? I mean, the responsibilities in terms of retaining data, you know, persistence, there's responsibilities in terms of uh, providing an interface. There's responsibilities in terms of the internal workings that drive that interface. And, you know, just dealing with it in terms of responsibilities instead of, you know, the actual nitty-gritty, okay, this is a method, this is an unbound function, um, gives you, a, you know, a higher level to, to uh, interact with things. All right, so technology. <laughs> it is the 21st century. We do have a lot more technology than we used to. We don't have to deal with it with paper and pencil or even our, you know, just our screens anymore. There are a lot of tools that we can uh, bring to the forefront. So for, let's see, I don't have anything. There's technology to help capture things. There's recording apps. There's uh, screencasts. Now, I recently saw a, a demo um, by a Microsoft employee He'd seen something that PyCon that came out of PyCon, where someone was using voice activation to uh, get his way through Emacs, and he thought, "Ha, Vim would be great for this. I'd like to have that for that." So he coded up in F Sharp uh, his own solution to that. He used .NET and whatnot. You know, F Sharp isn't my language, but what he did was he then navigated through the code. You know, he, he demonstrated it. But then he navigated through the code and he talked about the code, you know, as a screen capture, as a video cast. And I was like going, well, heck, you know, you're going through code. You're, you're like trying to f figure it out. Why not capture it as you go through it? You, you can talk about it right there. You got something to go back to. You know, uh, one way to review things is to get close, as close as you can to what all was occurring in that experience the first time. It's a perfect way to capture things. Uh, memory aids. There's one program I like to use. It's called Anki. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. Uh, it's a Python app. And it's a flashcard program. There are lots of things we got to get up in our head. And, you know, at a certain level, this, might, this is a good aid for you. Um, and it is... It's, uh, it's a really cool program. I mean, it's got so much potential because it, it uses Python, uses a database, and it uses WebKit. So, I mean, you can do all sorts of colors and CSS sheets and JavaScript and do really fancy things that, you know, you wouldn't imagine you could do to make a really, you know, impactful presentation. Not saying there are much examples out there yet, but it's got a lot of potential. And it's Python, so it's something like I want to be reading and checking out with. 
uh, your editor. You know, getting familiar with your editor because, like I said, you're dealing with a lot of loads of client of of code. I mean, really, your editors, it's the one that can know all those lines of code, letter by letter, word by word. Let it remember it. Your job is to be able to like bounce around inside of that code using your editor, using using the ways you search things, the way you find things, the ways you grep for things to get around and you know pull things out of the code that you know you need to pay attention to. Get to a routine, you know, you know, run C tags on it, you know, and go through the tags until you can pull up the definition of a function as you encounter it. There are lots of things in your editor that are built in. Uh, one of the most Useful ones that I, you know, could recommend is uh, there's there's completion. You know, we all use completion. We, we we don't like to type out these big long identifier names and whatnot, and they can get pretty darn long. But really, the you know the built-in completion is a little dumb because you know you're typing out the first part of a word. Well, there's something that's you know sometimes called an, an acronym. Yeah, this has got to look good on the video. Let's postpone again. <laughs> uh, um, what was it? Yeah, I mean, um, there's something that, uh, yeah. Okay, let me finish this up then. I'm, so I have a little bit of time for questions. There's something that's called acronym uh, completion, where you type the first letter of each word in your identifier, because identifiers are usually combo words, and then you complete on that. You know, it's a much better way to, you know, complete because you're like keeping in your head something that actually, you know, relates to your remembering that function name as opposed to, oh, yeah, it's one of those things that starts with combine uh, and, then it's, and then just picking that out of a list. All right. Outlining. Outlining is another tool. I mean, uh, your editor will probably do this cold folding which is a way to concentrate things so you can like pick out the points. Uh, there are other editors or other plugins for your editors that will go through and give you a two pane editor. I, let's see if I've got that up. So here I've got on the, on the left, got, on the right I've got the Python code, on the right, strictly computed and not actually a, a file is you know, there's the salient points that let me navigate inside of this code. This is a plugin for Vim called uh, Voom, V-O-O-M. Very interesting, very good way to deal with code. Uh-huh, thank you. I don't want a new tab. Did I just kill my editor or what? No, there it is. All right, uh, graphic tools, we don't use that so, so much, but you know, you, there are tools available to make graphs, simple graphs. You know, there are tools to take ASCII, dri drawn graphs, and turn it into nice, pretty ones. And here we get to Catherine's talk later. You know, we're just starting talking about dealing with the, the text as you know, written, the, our code as written. You know, we really, you know, you know, want some tools to deal with it when it's running, and IPython is a perfect tool to do that. And now with the new notebook, notebook, notebook features, you can do those explorations and save them so that they're available to you. And another way to deal with running code is to write your own code. All right, and this is what I said the talk was going to be. It was going to be dealing with this application called Plover, but yeah, I don't think we really got time on that. There was actually a presentation on at uh, PyCon that's available. Uh, just one thing to say about it, it's like the future of typing. Uh, if you've seen stenotype machines, no matter how much you improve your typing, and you may or may not type at a really horrendous rate, I know some people who do, I don't, you'll never match what a stenographer can do. And this makes stenography available, and oddly enough, the person who... Uh, who you know, writes with this uses it uses Vim and uses it to control Vim and to enter her code right into Vim or, or whatever she's making, and at you know she's actually a captioner for uh, blind people, no blind people, deaf people <laughs> wouldn't be so good for blind people, <laughs> but.
captioner for deaf people. That's what she does for a job. And this this is a free and open software written in Python that does this. And it, so it's a really interesting code base and something that I want to do for some of the you want to know for some of the things I do. Okay, uh, we've probably only got a minute or two for questions, if that. Any questions? What's your book? Oh, uh, what? you're holding up for me. Oh, oh, you want? To, hopefully, it'll get in the slides when I put my slides up on Twitter. Yes. I was going to do that and have these in the slides, and when I actually get them up there on my uh, GitHub account, and I also signed up for Show Bar, so they should be able to like, get you to the notes too at some point. You mentioned the Russian engineer with the, working with the TRIST, like the four letters, uh, or an acronym of that. Uh, well, it's T R I Z. You know, I think it's what it's known by. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It was interesting work. I mean, it's like a cheese knife. Okay, <laughs> you cut cheese with a knife. What what can you take away from the knife to make a better knife? Well, take away the the part that's blacking up, making up the blade. And there's several approaches to that. There's the wire. There's the knives that have the holes in it. You just found these patterns that just kept on recurring inside of patterns, inside of patterns, and you know he advanced engineering in a sense. And this is another step along that way. So that's why I would recommend that book. Anything else? Oh, Catherine. So there are book clubs for mysteries and novels, and is there a book club for code? Well, you know, it's interesting you act. I just ran across something. Um, I, was, I think it's called like Programmer's Workshop where this uh, teacher was telling his students that he was like opening up a site where people could like track, you know, like uh, athletic sites where you track, you know, you, how many miles you've run or how many that. It's like for exercises and learning coding, you know, like make a, make a promise on uh, a module you're going to study, make a promise on uh, you're practicing some typing, you know, you know Learning some, learning your editor a little bit better. You 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 know make goals and you can talk about it. And it's like got social functions to it. Not sure how you know, what a bigger presence it has now. But there are those things, and you know there are code dojos and things like that. That you know, I'd like to see more of that happening. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay.